So um, I was trying to decide whether to get into the hormone section of endocrines or the style signaling of endocrines. And I think the hormone portion is a little bit easier. And we have um, a secondary topic today. So I decided I was going to go with the hormones. Um, normally, I do a few follow-up activities with this. But like we said, we're just going to plow through and work like our extra time is spent studying, going over practice questions, um, clicking on any of those links that I gave you, looking at videos, using your practice book, reading the tutorials, yada, yada. Um, so... I did not put any extra um, items in for this chapter. And then um, kind of along with that, we, we have that be better or no better, be better theme going on in our target class. So we're gonna connect with that um, as our secondary topic. And this is um, something all first hours are doing today. So we'll get through today's um, content and then we'll hit hit the secondary topic. Um, so make sure I'm sharing my video with my friends. Not video, but you know what I mean. Thank you for joining me here on the slide set. This is not one of the slides that I have revised and updated, um, but the hormones still do what they've always done. Um, so looking at the endocrine system, Endocrine system is re referring to glands and the release of organs. So common glands that you would um, see talked about. So we talked about the pituitary gland already when we did the nervous system. Also the pineal gland, the thyroid gland, the thymus we already talked about with the immune system. You have parathyroid glands, para is around. So you can see how these para thyroids are kind of on the outer boundaries or embedded within the edges of the thyroid. The adrenal gland, which you've heard the word adrenaline, so you can jump to a conclusion there. The pancreas, which we've mentioned um, with the immune system, actually with autoimmune disease, uh, we talked about diabetes. And ovaries and testes, you guys talked about freshman year. So um, we should be a little bit familiar with that as well. So this is connecting with two of our four big ideas, energy and homeostasis, as well as information signaling. And that's all of that um, cell communication components. We should be able to compare and contrast nervous system and endocrine. Nervous system is fast, um, fast acting. Endocrine system takes a little bit more time, um, but the nervous system's response is short lived, whereas the endocrine system is long lived. Compare the location of the receptors for peptide and steroid hormones. So remember, we're talking on the surface of the cell's membrane. We have those marker proteins, we have receptor proteins, channel proteins. You guys should be able to talk about lots of different components within the cell membrane, especially the proteins. Um, so a peptide, a protein-based hormone is going to um, enter a cell differently than a steroid hormone. And if you remember the steroids, we had those four um, ring structures connected all the way back to chapter three. Um, so that they belong to the lipids. Um, explain why secondary messengers are needed for most peptide hormones. So the primary messenger would be the peptide hormone itself. And then the secondary messenger is going to be one inside of the cell. Describe the relationship between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Hypothalamus, we talked about, is one of the components of the inner brain. Um, describe a typical negative feedback loop. So negative feedbacks um, cause the stimulus to go away. It doesn't mean um, necessarily that the response causes a lowering of something. Um, other than the stimulus itself. And then compare negative and positives, whereas the positive feedback causes that stimulus to continue. So that's what we're looking at. So the endocrine system releasing hormones allows for us to regulate homeostasis, um, allows us to maintain stability within our systems, basically. Um, it also allows for communication through the whole body similar to the nervous system, but the nervous system is sending signals 
via neural transmitters through neurons. The endocrine system is sending signals via hormones through the bloodstream. So um, hormones are going to be released from a cell in a gland. They'll travel through the bloodstream to some target organ. And then that is where it will cause its response. So here you can see the pituitary gland releasing some kind of hormone that will travel through the bloodstream to the liver, to the muscles. It's probably growth hormone. Um, chemical messengers, uh, da, 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 sorry. Um, some of the things that help to regulate or that we're regulating is like our glucose levels, that's your insulin. Calcium levels, salt levels, water balance, all of those things need to be regulated to maintain like a small range. So we're not fluctuating beyond that range. Um, metabolism. So insulin is a good example, breakdown and use of the, the um, insulin. Growth hormone allows for development, the metamorphosis of an organism, the maturation. You've gone through this yourself and the reproductive cycle, of course. Okay, so this is showing you the human growth hormone in particular. So released from the pituitary gland can travel through the bloodstream. And here you see that it's going to bind with a receptor on the surface of the cell. So again, this is much like the enzyme substrate complex, like we um, worked with yesterday as well. We talked about the antibody antigen matching shapes. Um, you could also refer to like the ligand and the receptor, um, the ligand and the channel proteins. Um, we did that one in the nervous system. So they all work pretty similar. So ductless gland just means there's not tubes connected to it. They secrete chemicals directly into the bloodstream, travels through the bloodstream to a target organ where it will cause a response. They're slow, but long lasting. The nervous system, as you saw, it really deals more with an electrical impulse, right? So that, that neurotransmitter that's released causes an action potential, causes that negative positive switch, depolarization of a cell, um, moves through neurons, it's fast and short lasting. So an immediate response, long-term response. And this is showing you um, a comparison of the two, right? The axon of the neuron is going to release uh, this would be acetylcholine. I can tell these are muscle cells. Um, this, it's going to release some sort of neurotransmitter that acts as a ligand, binds to a channel protein, and causes a response. Endocrine system, very similar, released into the bloodstream, and that hormone will bind to a receptor protein and cause response. So very similar actions. Um, we're going to find that this is going to be unique to protein-based hormones. Um, the lipid-based hormones react differently. So hormones um, are produced one or more, or can produce one or more of the following reactions. So once it binds to the cell or travels through the cell membrane, it might alter the plasma's membrane permeability, which is like what acetylcholine does on the muscle cell. It alters the permeability of sodium. Um, it can stimulate protein synthesis. It can activate or deactivate an enzyme system. So puts it in an active form, for example, or an inactive form. Um, this protein synthesis, like it serves as, um, a gene regulator, basically turning on the transcription of a certain gene, induces secretory activities. So secretions are when um, items are packaged for transport and used elsewhere in the body. Excretion is a waste. So it's still packaged and it leaves the cell, but it's not something that's going to be used by another part of, like by another cell. Um, can also be one of those components regulating the cell cycle and therefore stimulates mitosis. So these are our two types, our protein-based hormones um, we were, or peptide-based hormones, however you want to call them. They're the most common. Insulin and ADH are two good examples. And again, we don't need to know every hormone 
If you understand how insulin or ADH works, then you understand how protein-based hormones work. And that will be true of any protein-based hormone. Glycoproteins. Um, so this is a glyco is referring to sugar, carbohydrate of some sort connected with the proteins. So FSH and LH, maybe you remember them from ninth grade, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, they regulate um, production of sperm and eggs. Um, your amines, so notice the ending here, epinephrine, melatonin, um, those are amine-based. So they're modified amino acids. Um, epinephrine, you've probably heard of an EpiPen. Works like adrenaline, speeds up the heart. Lipid-based hormones, so these are our um, steroids. They are lipid-soluble, which means they can actually fuse with the cell membrane and move through the cell membrane without a receptor protein. We talked um, in chapter three, I believe, about different examples. We looked at estrogen, progesterone, um, testosterone. We saw how like there was a single element, a single atom different between them. Aldosterone. ADH and aldosterone work similar to regulate water volume or blood volume, um, but notice there one is a protein base and one is a lipid base. So we'll talk about one of those. So the lipid based hormones, because they are lipid based, they are hydrophobic, right? Water fearing. They're lipid soluble. Remember the inside of the membrane is lipid based, also hydrophobic. So it will be able to move through the cell membrane very easily. It can bind to receptor proteins in the cytoplasm rather than on the surface of the cell. Often binds to DNA as transcription factors. Remember we talked about polymerase um, and transcription factors both need to be present for a gene to be turned on. The protein base are hydrophilic. Notice the difference. So they can't enter the cell membrane on their own. So they will bind to receptor proteins on the surface of the cell. So this one is inside of the cell. This was on the surface, which is why you need the secondary messenger because it can't enter itself. So this triggers the secondary um, pathway, the secondary messenger pathway, activating internal cellular responses, whatever that may be, whether it's um, mitosis or action, like um, activating an enzyme, uptake or secretion of molecules. So here is a look at um, a steroid hormone. This is the cell, the target cell. This would be the bloodstream. The red is the bloodstream. And then of course, a gap that all things need to um, move across. So we can see the blood is carrying this steroid hormone, steroid because it's a lipid. Um, and that will be released, crosses through the cell membrane through diffusion, simple diffusion. No uh, protein molecules are needed. Binds with a receptor protein on the inside of the cell. And from there, this combination will enter the nucleus, for example, and serve as a transcription factor, turning on whatever gene you need. So different hormones will signal different genes to be produced. Um, so then it will go through its transcription. Now I'm in the central dogma. It makes my messenger RNA which exits through the nuclear pore, goes out to the ribosome. I knew this was the ribosome because it has two separate units. Produces some sort of polypeptide. You'll be able to talk about the primary amino acid sequence, the secondary um, beta pleat or alpha helix due to the interaction of hydrogen um, ions in neighboring amino acids to the tertiary hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions, ionic interactions. Um, also disulfide bridges, and perhaps a quaternary where it combines with other polypeptides. To make the final protein for export or use by the cell. Maybe it's myosin or um, actin and myosin, which is used for muscle contraction. Maybe it is a whole nother hormone, a protein hormone maybe. Um, but whatever the protein is made, then it's secreted, could be a growth factor, which causes growth of hair, bones, muscles, 
and gametes. So that's how a lipid-based hormone would work. This is a protein-based hormone. Right away, I can see there's a difference. The protein is binding to the outer surface of the membrane. It cannot enter the membrane itself. So this is my target cell. This is my plasma membrane. There's a lot going on in here. The receptor protein. So once this protein um, hormone binds the receptor protein, it causes a chain of events. So it's kind of like a relay and we're going to pass the baton. So this is going to activate a cytoplasmic signal. So this um, molecule that's inside of the um, plasma is called GTP, guanine triphosphate. Remember all of your nucleotides have a triphosphate form. So this GTP will bind um, and activate this G protein. It's called a G protein because it responds to GTP. So it needs the GTP in order to be in the active form. You'll cleave that, activate it, which activates an enzyme, <clears throat> kinase. You have this CAMP, cyclic AMP. So notice this ATP is going to dephosphorylate, lose its phosphates, become um, AMP, and then it's going to cycle back and gain phosphates to become ATP. This is why it's called cyclic AMP. This is your secondary messenger. So now this begins an amplification of the signal. So it activates an enzyme kinase and that activates another enzyme and it keeps sending the signal um, from one molecule to another, much like a relay. We call this signal transduction. When we um, pass the signal along a number of molecules, so that is our secondary messenger system, ultimately producing whatever the action is that we need. <clears throat> so we call that our response. So you can refer to these as signal transduction pathways. You're taking the signal from inside of the cell and then you're um, passing it along a, a series of molecules to ultimately create a response. So epinephrine, um, first of all, is this a protein-based or a lipid-based? Yes, I didn't have to have that memorized. I don't have to memorize all my hormones. I could see that this is binding to a receptor protein on the surface of the cell. That's what gave it away that it was a protein-based um, hormone. I can also see the GTP and the G protein right here. <clears throat> So when epinephrine or AKA adrenaline binds this receptor protein, that is the initial signal. It's gonna activate the GTP. GTP will bind, dephosphylate, binds to the G protein, which activates the G protein, which then activates an adenine cyclase, which is specific to this example. And the ATP, um, will dephosphorylate, becomes CAMP, C-A-M-P. This is where it's activating the protein kinase. And I threw that word around a few times on the last slide. Remember, we talked about kinases, CDKs. Um, we talked about kinases during the, the um, cell cycle section. Kinases phosphorylate other molecules to activate them, right? So when we dephosphorylated the ATP, we're gonna phosphorylate another molecule. This act activates another kinase, which then phosphorylates another molecule. So the phosphate is kind of like your baton in this relay. Um, and it goes through a series of phosphorylations. So passing it from one kinase to another, that's our transduction. Ultimately, this glycogen will be broken down and releases glucose. Glucose is the sugar that our bodies use to produce energy, right? So we can have a stored form in our muscles and liver called glycogen that was similar to starch, right? It was that polysaccharide. So we'll break down the glycogen to release glucose in order to have more ability to make um, energy for our body to respond to things, which is what epinephrine is doing. It's preparing you for fight or flight. And that is the response. 
Any questions on that one? That's a lot, a lot of words, right? So this is the benefit of the secondary messenger. So I can see my protein binding to the receptor protein. I can see my GTP right here, this little teardrop binding to the G protein. And from here, this is an amplification. So it's not going to just signal one of these to respond, but it's signaling them all. So now I went from having one signal to having three signals in this example. So each one of these GTPs will phosphor or will, yeah, will activate um, separate G proteins. And then again, amplification occurs. This one G protein, and this is happening in all three of them, right? So we can picture this all going on here too. So this one will um, cause the dephosphorylation of multiple ATPs to form CAMP. So we're making our signal bigger. And then each one of these is going to um, activate the kinase and each one of those is going to activate another kinase and each one of those is going to activate another kinase. So you're amplifying or making your signal bigger, you're having a greater response. So that's the benefit of the secondary messenger. Questions? Dun, dun, dun. This is called a cascade when you have um, like the the product of one reaction immediately starts the next reaction, which immediately starts another reaction. That's called a cascade, kind of like a waterfall. So this is the whole concept of maintaining homeostasis. You have whatever your body condition is. It could be your blood sugar level. I want it to fluctuate only within this range. I, want, I have a blood pH level. I only want it to fluctuate in this range, 6.8, 7.2 not above, not below. My body temperature is gonna fluctuate in this small range and everything's okay. So if it gets out of that range, there's gonna be a response to bring it back into the range. This is a negative feedback. So it counteracts the stimulus. So if it's high, you'll signal a certain gland to release a hormone, which will cause a response, lowering the condition. If it's low, you're gonna signal a different gland to reduce, release a different hormone which causes an increase to bring it back up, right? So it's like a teeter-totter. So this is a basic negative feedback loop and it will work with any negative feedback you talk about, whether it's your blood pressure, your water levels, any of it. So this is looking at the body temperature, your hypothalamus in your brain is what controls your body temperature. So we wanna be right around 37 degrees Celsius. If we get above that level, right, our hypothalamus is going to send signals to our um, skin and our skin will produce sweat um, and the sweat will evaporate and the act of evaporation will draw heat from your skin, right, and release it into the environment, which will bring our body temperature back down to approximately 37 degrees. If it's cold, I can come back to that. If it's cold, I'm gonna release a different signal from my hypothalamus, which causes my muscles to shiver, which creates heat, which brings my temperature back up. This is showing dilation of the blood vessels. So I guess I should have mentioned this. Um, the dilation of the blood vessels puts put your blood, which is the source of your heat, closer to the surface of your body and therefore evaporation more likely occurs. You'll notice like desert animals that live in the desert, um, they have a broad surface area. Maybe it's their ears. Thin ears and a wide surface area allows for lots of evaporation to occur. So that would be an adaptation that organisms have to live in those hot environments. And constricting blood vessels takes our blood away from the surface, so we'll lose less heat to the environment. I see, I need a new picture. So often you see an example with um, insulin or ADH. Those are very common ones to see. So this is showing you, this is not in the figure eight pattern, but it's the same concept. If our blood sugar levels are low, our pancreas will be signaled, which will activate 
glucagon, which is a hormone released from um, our pancreas, from the alpha cells. You have alpha cells and beta cells. So this is going to um, release glucagon into the bloodstream, which then will act, will um, tie up the, the sugar into that polysaccharide, the glycogen. Um, and so that will lower our blood sugar level. If it's high, we're gonna do the opposite. The beta cells are gonna release the insulin. The insulin will um, I did that backwards, right? I said it ties it up. This side is tying up the sugar. This side is releasing the sugar. Um, so it, so in this case, the insulin will cause the glucose to all bind together. And so it'll be tied up in the form of glycogen. The figure eight that you're used to seeing, same thing. This is referring to when levels are high above the eight. And this is when levels are low. So we wanna stay at this level right here, about 90 mil micrograms per, or milligrams per milliliter, 100 milliliters. So if we're high, then the pancreas releases the insulin to tie up the sugar into glycogen and store it in the liver. And then this is if our levels are low, we're gonna break down that glycogen. So we release glucagon to break down glycogen and release glucose into the blood. Okay, so that's negative feedback because the stimulus is going away. I no longer am above or below my um, sugar levels. So if, I, if my sugar levels were high, they're no longer high. Um, osmo refers to water, right? So water levels in the hypothalamus. Again, the hypothalamus regulates blood pressure, or I'm sorry, um, temperature and thirst and hunger, those sorts of things. So um, if I have a high concentration, remember osmolarity refers to the solute concentration in the water. We can go back to membrane um, transport. So if the concentration is high, that's going to increase your thirst. So you've probably experienced that after eating a really salty meal. Um, and if the levels are low, then um, we will release a different gland. We're gonna release renin from the kidneys. This is going on in AP or in that right now, right, Sophie? Um, and May. So um, if our salute levels are low, then we're going to um, release renin, which begins this cascade that converts angiotensin into angiotensin II, which ultimately um, stimulates aldosterone to cause water reabsorption. So it's going to reabsorb salt and then water follows salt. So then that brings our blood pressure levels back to what they should be. Okay, so here's um, a couple of glands you should be familiar with. This is a connection between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So the hypothalamus um, regulates the pituitary gland. So that's your big connection between nervous system and endocrine system. So in the nervous system, it receives information about from nerves around the body um, about internal conditions, like we just saw with the temperature, right? It releases hormones that, so this is an endocrine connection, regulates the release of hormones from the pituitary. And the pituitary, you have a whole bunch of hormones that are, are released both from the anterior and posterior. Anterior refers to the front, posterior refers to the back, um, that are tropic hormones. Tropic means they regulate other glands. So here is the anterior pituitary in blue, and the posterior pituitary in purple. So we can see lots of glands are regulated um, by this, this, lots of glands are regulated by hormones that are released from this pituitary. So thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, um, stimulates the thyroid. We have adrenal corticotropic hormone for the adrenal gland. Um, we have growth hormone. We have the gonadotropic releasing hormones. So these are stimulating the testes and ovaries to release um, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Um, we have prolactin, 
which stimulates the um, mam mammary, mammary glands to release milk. Um, and melanocytes, melanocytes, did we read that section in? The um, survival of the sickest, there's a chapter talks about when you wear your sunglasses, you're more likely to get burned than when you don't wear your sunglasses because the sunlight triggers melanocytes to produce melanin, which is a pigment. Um, and so that protects us from the burn when our skin is darker. So this is producing melanin. And then oxytocin, so this is from the posterior pituitary and you don't have to have this memorized, it would be in a, in a question prompt. You just have to know how they communicate and if something goes wrong, what effect that would have. So if you messed up one step in the cascade, you'd mess up every other step along the way, right? So oxytocin, which is needed for the contraction of the uterus, an antidiuretic hormone, ADH, which we, um, diuresis is the formation of urine. So antidiuresis is, is stopping the flow of urine. So um, that's gonna help reabsorb water. I am going to skip this one. And I kind of just talked about those, so I'm gonna skip that. So um, this is an example of that feedback loop. This should look familiar. We've actually, we've used that word negative feedback before, haven't we? When we were talking about regulating genes. So the thyroid stimulating hormone, um, TRH is released from the, the hypothalamus, thyroid um, releasing hormone. And then that is going to release the, cause the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone, which is going to regulate thyroxines. So that um, tells the thyroid to produce thyroxine hormones. And when we've had enough, this is gonna go back and work as a negative feedback. Um, to turn the stimulus off. So it kind of works like a teeter-totter in that way. Um, this regulates metabolism and development. As you can see, bone growth, mental development, metabolic use, blood pressure, heart rate, muscle tone, digestion, reproduction, all those things. Um, we need iodine to convert tyrosine into thyroxine, which is why we now iodize our stuff. We can get a goiter, this is a goiter, um, if this mechanism is not working. So if you're deficient in iodine and you can't convert your into thyroxine, um, your thyroid will continue to release that hormone because it, we don't have the stopping mechanism. You haven't reached the level of thyroxine to turn it off. So it gets enlarged um, due to the, um, overproduction of the thyroid. So you can see that looks like it would be very painful. And this is why we've been adding iodine to our salts. Parathyroid embedded here, these little um, seed looking glands within the thyroid gland, they help regulate your blood calcium levels. So when blood um, calcium levels are low, it triggers your bone to break down um, bone tissue to release calcium. So we could talk about osteoclasts that break down the bone cell, the bone material, the matrix to release the calcium. Um, you got the insulin regulating blood glucose. You got glucagon regulating blood glucose as well. Insulin lowers it, ties the glucose up into glycogen. Glucagon breaks down the glycogen to release the glucose. Uh, we talked about those, epinephrine, adrenaline, the adrenal gland sitting on top of the kidney. So we talked about the adrenal gland being part of that fight or flight. I might remind you the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the fight or flight. It's going to increase um, blood glucose levels so that you have more um, energy available. It's gonna increase your heart rate so you're delivering more oxygen to muscles, blood pressure, breathing rate, all have to do with that as well. Norepinephrine, you might hear that hormone and it works the same as epinephrine. So the word is in, embedded in it as well. Cortisol, we haven't talked about yet. Cortisol is your stress hormone. Um, so this increases blood glucose levels as well. And then aldosterone, I mentioned, controls salt and water balance. 
I'm actually going to be talking about that today in second and third hours. Um, erythropoietin is released from the kidney that produces red blood cells. Renin angiotensinogen, also talked about today in second hour, um, controls blood volume and um, your concentration of potassium, sodium, um, because water and salt are directly related. So this is showing you the example of the blood calcium levels. So um, you have parathyroid hormone here. Um, if blood calcium levels are low, we already talked about that one. Um, the other one is calcitonin. So when blood levels are high, calcitonin takes the calcium out of the blood and stores it in your bones. And so these are trying to regulate your blood calcium levels to keep it in that narrow range. And I've kind of talked about that. Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, we've talked about those before. Um, regulated to pregnancy. If there is no pregnancy, um, gonadotropin releasing hormone stimulates pituitary to release FSH and LH. Follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the follicles to release eggs, luteinizing hormone. Um, we'll just, let's say, mature the eggs and then luteinizing hormone causes the release of the eggs. The estrogen prepares the body for pregnancy, thickens the um, lining of the uterus and such. And then progesterone will further the preparation for pregnancies. So if there is a pregnancy, we're going to go into a positive feedback loop. We're going to continue to release progesterone to continue that pregnancy regulation. If there is no pregnancy, then um, progesterone levels will drop. The inner lining is shed and the whole process begins again. So this is showing you um, this negative feedback that when the FSH is high, the estrogen is low. Um, and then this is more of our positive feedback that when it's high, it continues to remain high if there were a pregnancy. He has got too much growth hormone. This guy, tallest man in the world, eight feet, 11. What questions do you have? <laughs> 